So I want to take you on a little bit of a journey back before we had Homo sapiens to Homo habilis, one of the first men to work, walk on the planet. Not the best looking of guys, but then he probably was the only one that was on the planet or very few thereof. And we want to look at how different our genetic makeup is to theirs and maybe importantly see how did that change come about over 2.8 million years and maybe we'll address some of the points about how slow evolution is and maybe we could speed things up so to cut a very very long story short approximately 60 million years ago we looked like this first guy and today we look an awful lot better I hope but essentially over time and evolution our genes or the genetic components of our being selectively or preferentially choose traits that are, are, are suited to survival, suited to being more fit. This mic is terrible. Um, and over time, we get better. And we like to think that what we're doing is our, our choices lead us to that improvement, but really our genetics are what behind make, making us look so good. So when you take the components of one with another and you mate them, you hope for the best. And you hope that this baby, which com contains both of the components of the mother and the father, will have the best of both of you. But bacteria have been doing this for a lot longer than humans, and they are the pros when it comes to survival. They have survived on this planet for four billion years. And they're only single-celled organisms, mostly. But within these single-celled organisms, they have what are the most fundamental blueprints of life. And there isn't a single gene that we have that bacteria don't also have. So it leads us on to something that they know a little bit about what is essential when it comes to survival. Now I know you probably judged Homo habilis for looking pretty bad in his Instagram, but if we look at the first ever photo that could have been taken of you, this is what you looked like. Once upon a time, we like bacteria were also single-celled. And this in the middle, as you see, is the two parental genomes. So you have the uh, instructions from mom and dad, and they're meeting in the middle, and they are about to combine to make the newest form of life, and that's you. And the blueprint of life, as you know, is DNA. Now, deoxyribonucleic acid, even though it's simple in its composure, in that it's only made up of just four nucleotides, a, T, G, and C essentially can come up with a million different formulas for other things that we, could, we, we can form. And with these very simple um, building blocks, we can form very complex things. But more complex than the actual structure of DNA is the fact that it can compact into every single one of the cells in our body. So fast forward from that one cell to 20 or 37 trillion cells later, and that's what every single one of you are carrying around, roughly. I think some of you might have less than others. But we have, in every single one of these cells, we have our entire genome. The entire blueprint is compacted very neatly into each one of those cells. And genes are essential. These, these genes that these uh, words spell are essential for encoding the different things that make us different from each other. Now, some, in some ways, you might say that genetics is very special and that we are unique in ourselves. And in other ways, when you compare us to bacteria and the fact that they share an awful lot of the same genes as we do, and the fact that we are 50% so similar to a banana, it makes you think a little bit less preciously about your own genome. Regardless, mistakes in the genome take place an awful lot. And mutations in our DNA are exactly like these spelling mistakes. If you think that every single letter in the genome has to spell a certain word, well, sometimes you can get that spelling wrong. And I'm going to give you an example. So if you were to look up something really fascinating like genome editing, and you typed it into Google, but you left out the E, the search results are very, very different. Now, among these search results, you'll see that they all have similar characteristics. And it's in this mistakes finding and the similarities that we see when mistakes occur that we can actually use mutations to our advantage, both to study disease and to figure out how we can prevent it. So examining DNA to understand development is crucial. 
when I said conservation, it means when something is the same throughout generations. A single gene remains so important that it stays from 60 million years ago to now. And sometimes we can look at genes and know that they are expressed or that they are present in the same tissues of every different body, even among different species. So this conservation of DNA gives us clues to what those genes do. And it allows us to study diseases. But in order to study diseases, we often have to wait for those mistakes to occur. And that's time consuming. Another method is to induce a mutation. And we can do this in certain cells using UV. We all like to mutate ourselves every time we sit in the sun. But UV light can cause DNA damage to occur whereby it actually breaks. So we can induce mutations also to, to study development. And we have been doing this actually to our advantage for quite a long time. So if we go through a timeline of genetic modification, back in the 60s, after the war, um, atomic gardening, which was a type of mutation breeding where plants were exposed to radioactive sources, typically cobalt-60, this was part of a program called Atoms for Peace. And it was, a, it was essentially a way of promoting a more peaceful use of fission energy. Now in the 70s, scientists began putting pieces of DNA, like bacteria, into other pieces. And this was called recombinant DNA technology. And people were a little bit horrified by this in the beginning because they couldn't understand why you would put the DNA of one species into another. Nonetheless, in, the, in, the, in 74, Beatrice Mintz created the world's first transgenic mouse, meaning that this mouse was made from the DNA of other, other um, organisms as well as its own. And this allowed us, this catapulted us in our ability to study disease beyond what we was ever possible before, because it meant that what we could do was locate a certain gene in the genome and find out exactly what it was doing. And how we did this was by putting little reporter mark molecules next to the gene of interest. I'll show you how in a minute. Moving on to the 80s, um, pseudoeruginosa um, bacteria was genetically engineered to eat oil spills. So this was a more commercial use of recombinant DNA technology. And maybe many of you would have been familiar with the flavor saver tomato, which came out in 1994. And this was met with much concern about GM and that we shouldn't be doing genetic modification of food. But simply all it had was a deletion of the gene which made tomatoes rot quite quickly. And it meant that tomatoes were able to last for a lot longer on the shelf. Now, in this timeline of genetic modification, we now actually take for granted that most of the clotting factors, hor growth hormone, or vaccines that we currently use today are actually by produced by means of engineered life. So when people talk about genetic modification in terms of plants or animals or healthcare, actually, we've been there for quite a long time. So if I were to ask you, if you were to have a superpower, what would it be? Would you choose super strength, the ability to glow in the dark, or ultra fast healing? I remember thinking before, very, very late in the lab, what my superhuman strength would be, would be to make my experiments go faster. Back using the old methods of recombination, and genetic recombination, we pretty much relied on chance. We would hope that the DNA of interest would go into the organism that we wanted it to. We would screen hundreds and hundreds of colonies. Now, newer techniques mean we can do it in a matter of weeks. Quite begrudgingly, I, I tell my students to pick a lot more colonies than they already need to because I just get a little bit bitter about the fact that they'll tell me they'll do two and that both of them will contain the gene of interest now. But these previous methods of engineered nucleases not only had long names, which I won't bore you with, but they also, the experiments were long too. On top of that, they were expensive. It was a little bit like trying to type with an old typewriter. I actually see a fair few gray heads that may have typed with typewriters. Some audience I've had look at me like I'm talking about the Stone Age. No offense. Then along came CRISPR. And CRISPR changed everything. It was a little bit like being given a computer, or better still, a smartphone. 
It enabled our ability to put pieces of DNA into organisms and beings at far, far greater capacity. But what is CRISPR-Cas? Now, while this structure may look even messier than most of your bedrooms, it is cleverly organized. Let me try and explain. So CRISPR stands for, are you ready? Clustered, regularly interspaced, short palindromic repeats. Good, we can all go home now. What it essentially refers to is the sequence of the DNA, okay? This sequence of genetic DNA in a bacteria is cleverly organized for a reason. So the CAS refers to the molecular scissors, okay? Remember that for a minute. Essentially, bacteria is a form of bacterial immunity. Now, we all recognize that we have bacteria or that we have immune systems and that those will fight off infection. And just like the vaccines I showed you earlier, the whole point of a vaccine is that I'll give you a little bit of the, of the dose that you may get. Your body learns how to react and fight that. It produces the antibodies that it needs to, to fight that infection should you have it. And it prepares your body for that. Well, bacteria are a little bit more clever again. So their immune system works to recognize, and yes, bacteria can get infections too, to recognize an invading pathogen. In comes the pathogen. And what this pathogen will try and do is insert its DNA into the bacterial ge genome. And this is the same for viruses. This is why when humans get an inf a viral infection, there's nothing you can do to treat it. That virus will live and live off its host, that's you, disturbing as that is, for the rest of your life. This is an actual cryo-electron microscope image of a bacteria being infected by a virus. What I find fascinating is that it actually quite looks like a spaceship or a foreign being landing on a, on a planet. So back to, this, back to this overly complicated series of words. And the words do mean something. I'm gonna break it down. So when you say that there are clustered regularly interspaced that means there are regions of the genome that there are pieces of dna that they couldn't figure out what these did but they knew that there was something strange about them in that they read the same way backward one way as they did the other way so they formed these loop structures and essentially what these in between spacing pieces were were pieces of viral dna that had previously tried to infect that bacteria but the bacteria had the ability to cut the dna and insert it into its own. So this ability to cut DNA and insert it into, your, into its own, thereby rendering that bacteria immune to any further infections, was what was key for the bacteria's ability to survive. It was, it was just like an immune system. It gave it the ability to fight off any future infections from a virus that had a similar DNA sequence. Are you with me? Good. If you weren't, a visual is always easier. Here we see a virus landing on the surface of a bacteria or a cell. What it will do is insert its own DNA into that bacteria. It does so that it, can, so that it can live independently. The bacterial immune system works so it produces two short, single-stranded guide RNAs. Now these lock together with the Cas, which is that endonuclease or molecular scissors. And when they do that, they form a complex. And how this complex works is to recognize the invading sequence, tag along, and cut it. Now what happens when DNA gets cut? It immediately wants to repair. Now there are two ways in which DNA can repair. One of them is where the ends will just quickly join together in any way they can. Another is where a template is needed. So where would you get a template if you needed to fix the DNA? Well, the limiting factor is that every time a cell divides, it has extra DNA going around. So the only time the second repair mechanism can happen is when cells are dividing. And we'll remember this later when it comes to the limitations of certain um, applications of genome editing and correction. So what are the benefits to CRISPR? It's been previously referred to as kitchen CRISPR um, and garage genomics. And that's because it is cheap, fast, relatively precise, 
And as Steve Jobs says, it just works. And it really does. I mean it when I say my students come back and they've picked two to screen. And I also mean it when I say I send them back and say, pick 10, please. So the things that it can be used for are pretty much endless. I'm only going to in into the human side of things here, but there are endless capacities for this ability to insert and play with genes when it comes to agriculture, when it comes to plants, when it comes to treatments. So the basic understanding of human biology should be the first and foremost one that we need to remember. It's all very fine getting ahead of ourselves saying, what can we do? What superpowers can we make? But actually, we don't know an awful lot about the human being. In fact, we know less about our earliest form of development than we do fruit fly, fish, pigs, chickens. We know less about our earliest forms of development. It's pretty clear to see why we can't test on humans yet. Nonetheless, there are so many things that we have yet to understand. So one fun function is that we can study models of human disease. And as I said, inserting the genome from one species in the, into another, you might think, how would I do that? How would I make that work for myself? Well, jellyfish have a gene which makes them glow. And this glowing gene can be isolated and inserted into other animals. And if you hook it up, almost like a little reporter system, you hook it up with the gene that you are looking to study, well then when you create that animal, in every tissue that that gene is present, it will glow. So some of my previous work worked on uh, ovarian development. And I worked on a very particular gene. And it was, that this gene wasn't just expressed in the ovaries, it was also expressed in the pituitary and in the eyelids. And so when I generated mice carrying a trans gene with a glowing reporter, these mice had glowing eyelids, a glowing pituitary, and glowing ovaries. I really wanted to coin the term glovaries, but it um, didn't really go anywhere. But what's in a name? It's important that we understand the differences between the two cell, cell types. Essentially, the most of us are made of somatic cells. These are the cells that live and die with you. For the most part, we shed them every single day, millions of them but it's the germ cells that people get precious about. Not old people, especially these ones. So I want to differentiate between the different types of cell therapy and the different diseases and targets for gene editing therapies. So these would be the somatic cells that we could potentially um, edit. And there's a list of some of the disorders, chronic heart failure, Duchenne muscular dystrophy, and these are some of the key targets for genome editing therapies. And how this works is I would take your own cells. You don't need a donor anymore. You don't need a blood transfusion and you don't need bone marrow transplant to be donated to you either. We can take your very own blood cells, extract them, and we fix the mutation in your own cells. We grow them up and then we retransfuse them back into you. It means there's no reason or no need for immun immunosuppressants. There's no fear that you're going to reject the host. You're not going to reject any of the treatment that you're given. And you have a much higher survival rate when it comes to doing autologous um, donation of your own cells. Now, this may seem space age, but it's actually already been done. This is uh, Leila. She was born in Great Ormond Street. And she was given every treatment there was known for a specific type of blood cancer that she had. Nothing worked and she was given weeks to live. And so a very special license was given, an experimental license, to try this new genome editing technology on her. Three years later, she is uh, thriving and well and shows no signs of the original cancer that she has. This man with uh, Hunter's syndrome has also been giving life-saving injection of genome editing tools using his own cells that have been edited, corrected, and put back into him. But for some, genome editing in other cells poses a risk, or poses rather an ethical question. And those are germline changes. Those are changes in your sperm or your egg or that one cell embryo that could make future changes to every generation after you. And the unfortunate thing is as soon as you do talk about germline genome editing, everyone wants to talk about designer babies. As though it's the, total, it's the most easy thing in the world to create a baby with Perfect pitch, 
like anyone would care. Or what I hate that they always say is that we'll make blonde hair, blue eyed babies. I really don't have a problem with that either, but nonetheless, designer babies are something that should be put back of our thoughts. It really should. Now, the first license was given in the UK to actually do uh, CRISPR genome editing on a human embryo. But this wasn't done to try and cure a disease. This wasn't done to try and avoid disease. This was done to find out about the fundamental beginnings of an early human embryo. It was done to look at some of the genes that we suspect are very important, but are crucial for us to know when it comes to recurrent pregnancy loss or unexplained um, pregnancy losses. And so the slippery slope argument comes into every single debate about germline genome editing. I'm probably one of the rare people who says, Where, where's the slide? I'd like, to, I'd like it to be as slippery as possible. Only because I've gone through the very difficult stages, and probably definitely not as hard as previous methods, of trying to make heritable or otherwise differences in a genome. It's difficult, and we've been on a long journey, and it's actually amazing that we've been given the tools that we have right now. So even if it was the easiest thing in the world, correction is still very complex. Let's take, for example, single gene disorders. So single gene disorders are those that are caused through mutations in just one gene. So those seem the most intuitive that you would aim to try and correct first. Now, while each of them individually is rare, it's thought that about 6% of people are affected in their lives with a single gene disorder. And the treatment for them is largely insufficient. We just manage the diseases through palliative care. We don't actually address the underlying defect. So let's take, for example, cystic fibrosis. Cystic fibrosis affects about 70,000 people every year. Um, it is caused due to mutations in the CFTR gene. This is a single gene disorder, sure, but it affects and targets multiple organs in this disease. And despite the fact that it is a single gene, there are nearly 2,000 different mutations of this gene, meaning that every single person, if they were go to go through therapy, would have to have their exact mutation targeted for themselves. Now it's easy to think again that maybe what we're doing is one step too far by putting CRISPR components into a one cell embryo. You don't really know what's gonna happen, do you? But it's also crucial to remember context. Context with everything. Just like they were doing genome editing in the 60s by doing blasts of radiation, we have been doing 40 years of me playing around, I nearly said messing around, playing around. That's not better actually, let's think. Exper no, it's not good to say experimenting either. We've been doing targeted medication um, for embryos for 40 years. So this year marks the uh, birthday of Louise Brown. She's 40 years old, so it's 40 years since this baby was made. And so the tools that we use in assisted reproduction are those that tie in really well with what we would use to add CRISPR. But this process isn't easy either. In order to do that, in order to get to, the, get to the stage where we have an embryo that we could edit, first of all, we need to take eggs from a woman and they need to be hyperstimulated so that they remove these eggs. That means you give them a lot of hormones, extract the eggs, then you have to fertilize them. The guys get the easy job. And this fertilization can either happen where you leave the egg, surrounded by sperm, and you let nature do its trick, or you would inject the, an individual sperm into that egg to try and fertilize it. Then you have to culture that embryo in a dish in su suitable conditions for three to five days. And you wait for it to go from two to four to eight to 120 cells large. And then your choices are you either transfer it back to the woman and hope for a successful pregnancy. One, you also hope that it doesn't contain, that it doesn't contain the mutation that you tried to select against. Or you can freeze those embryos, but regardless, they will need testing. And this whole process is being done every single day. Thousands of thousands of clinics. Eight million IVF babies have been born since Louise Brown. Now the testing process isn't necessarily smooth either. And I'm not telling you this to put you off CRISPR. I'm telling you this to question the methods we already use before you say that CRISPR might be dangerous. At day three, when there's about eight cells, 
you can make a laser hole in this outside wall and you can aspirate one of the blastomeres. So one of these cells will go for testing to check that you have definitely not got the mutation. The other time, type you can do it is at a later stage when there's about 120 cells. And again, you drill a laser hole in the outside of the embryo and you pull away some of the tissue for testing. It looks quite brutal. But millions of babies have survived this process and continue to do so. Now at the time when Louise Brown was born, people were horrified. In fact, the two doctors who did it lost their jobs. They had spent years trying to come up with the correct formula for how they could do all of the processes that I just told you about. Not just finding a way to sim stimulate a, a woman to produce more than one egg, not just finding the suitable conditions to grow these embryos in, but also finding a way to make it survive for long enough to last a pregnancy. Are we there yet with the technology? Probably not, even for IVF. Are we still trying? Absolutely. Is it worth it? Eight million babies would say so. And so we have to start somewhere when it comes to experimentation. And the first study that was done using CRISPR in human embryos was met with widespread concern. In fact, there was an international global summit that was held immediately after this because people were horrified that maybe this should be banned altogether, that a global moratorium should be put on any genome editing in a human embryo. The rebuttal argument was that they used embryos that would never have survived anyway. Nonetheless, this... Uh, the UK has gotten a license to do uh, CRISPR in human embryos and since then other, ta other studies have come out using this to correct all sorts of genetic disorders and, and clinical trials have been, have been given the green light. So it's important not to think about germline alterations for genetic enhancement. Although at a time I used to think something about designer babies was more like pigs might fly. And just out of interest, there has been a paper using CRISPR on genetically engineered pigs. Here they explain using DNA and Cas9 to uh, put donor DNA of a hot dog in, which is a clever way of describing it. But here are some examples of actually genetically modified pigs where they contain the green fluorescent protein in their snouts and toes. Now, regardless of what the fundamental findings of, a, of an experimentation are, essentially what we want to do is progress scientific knowledge. And so it's important to remember the definition of biomedical science, and that is to develop knowledge, interventions, or technology for the use in healthcare or public health to aid in our understanding and treatment of disease. Now, this is a long timeline, not nearly as long as the evolution of man. But it has been sped up, and we've been on a journey trying to do genetic alterations for many years, trying to find cures for centuries, trying to find treatments that work, not just giving pain, pain prescription, not just giving prescriptions for things that may temporarily alleviate symptoms, but make permanent changes that could do well. We're moving on to this, the generation of whole genome sequencing. Soon, every single baby will have every single letter of its genetic code read the day it is born so that we could actually tailor treatment and personalize medicine. And again, some people are afraid of this. And I think when we look back on the babies that are born now that have no, no chance of knowing what it is that, they, that is wrong with them and the babies that are born in delivery rooms where they have no idea of the diagnosis, and patients and parents are left waiting for weeks to know what can they do. It would seem actually clinically negligent to be able to have the information that could prevent any disorder in your child and not treat them accordingly. When we have 7.9 million births every year with congenital abnormalities, something has to change with the treatment. Let's give them superpowers. This is my PhD student, Veronica. She has muscular dystrophy, and we are currently sequencing her genome because she has a very rare type of muscular dystrophy whereby she can actually walk, albeit assisted. Her sister has been in a wheelchair since she was seven.
And we want to know why it is that they both have the exact same type of muscular dystrophy, and yet she can walk and her sister can't. This is giving her hope to find that maybe she can not do something for herself, but certainly for her children, which she was told she couldn't have before. Not only are these people the superheroes because they live with genetic disorders every day, but you too can be the superhero too by promoting the science that helps find cures and by being the scientist that finds them and implements them. Thank you.